Today we're talking about the true gospel and no fake news. I want to give a great welcome today to our new viewers on the great network across the United States of America, the CW Network. We're just so glad that you've joined our family of friends. Want to uh, give a special welcome too to our viewers in Ukraine on Hope TV and on 3ABN right around the world, also on Roku and Amazon Fire and lots and lots of outlets. And to our studio audience today, we give you an extraordinary uh, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Now today, as I talk about the true gospel, no fake news, I'm going to ask you to try to do something. I'm going to, going to ask you to try to step out of the box. Now, most of us are, are, are in little boxes. Sometimes they're boxes that have been made up by the church. So I want you to get out of your box by the grace of God and to think for yourself. May I say this? This is almost revolutionary. Don't trust the priest. He's not your authority. Don't trust the minister. Uh, he's just like me, makes lots and lots of mistakes. Certainly don't trust the politicians. <laughs> uh, these are authority figures, and people have been brainwashed into watching and believing in authority figures, including my own church. But I want to say to you, we need to discover the truth about the true gospel and not to be taken in by fake news. I want to tell you about John Carter. Would you like to hear about him? Yeah. 1625. This is not me. <laughs> Somebody... Uh, <laughs> Somebody may come to me later and they, they, uh, I'll say, uh, you look pretty well, but, you know, that's stretching. It's 1625. Okay, this is the story of John Carter in 1625. John Carter left England and immigrated to Virginia. He became a, a very wealthy landowner. He owned 13,500 acres with lots and lots of slaves. He became a member of the House of Burgesses and commander of the local militia, John Carter. Was he my relative? Yeah, of course he was. Yeah, he was. I'm talking about my relative, John Carter, who came here in 1625. He had, with his wife, sons and daughters, including Robert and John Carter II. After the death of John Carter II, Robert became the acting governor of the British colony. Hey, he's a big guy. 1726, the governor, the rector of the College of William and Mary. Ever heard of that place? It's a great university. He is called... Now, don't let this go to your heads. He is called uh, King Carter. <laughs> what are you folks laughing at? He's talking about King Carter. We're talking about King Carter. Uh, was he my relative? Yeah, of course he was. I don't know why you folks are laughing. I'm not saying anything to amuse you. I'm absolutely sober and serious. He became the richest and the most powerful man of his day. He had an estate of 333,000 acres and more than a 1,000 slaves, King Carter, plus 10,000 English pounds and a man's sum of money in those days. We're talking here today about King Carter. His grandson was... Robert Carter III, the largest single slave owner in the whole state of Virginia. He became uh, an American patriot. He renounced his oath of loyalty to King George of 
England, which as a British citizen, I still find uh, slightly offensive. <laughs> that was meant to be a crack up joke. <laughs> so he became an American patriot and I'm proud about this. He was neighbor to fellow slave owner, George who? George Washington, a big slave owner and the peer of the famous American, Thomas Jefferson. Robert Carter, descendant of John Carter, is called by the historian, the great emancipator. Is he related to me? Yeah, of course he is. In 1791, 70 years before the American Civil War, and before Abraham Lincoln. This man, the descendant of John Carter, Robert Carter, signed a document to release all his slaves before any other American had ever thought about it. 1791. He was a man many, many years ahead of his time. He thought outside the colonial American box. He was not brainwashed, not controlled by the crowd, not afraid to think differently. He was a non-traditionalist. And I ask you, what about you? We live today at a time in the history of the world and in the history of of the great republic of the United States of America when most people are inside their own boxes. And they haven't thought a new thought in 50 years. And I'm talking here about people who take the name of Christ. This man, the descendant of John Carter, was not a party man. He was not a company man. I've met them by the legion. What do you believe? I believe what my church believes. What does your church believe? My church believes what I believe. Well, what does your church believe and what do you believe? We think the same. This is mark of the beast thinking. This is not the thinking of the disciples of Christ. Now, this is very difficult because it's painful. Most people have given up thinking because it is painful. And I'm talking especially about religious people. This talk is an invitation to think for yourself about the most important subject which is the true gospel of Christ, because I tell you on the authority of history and the authority of scripture that most people do not understand the gospel of Christ. They believe in uh, fake news, I'm telling you. Now the text I want you to turn to is Revelation 13, 14 uh, to 17. You got it? And I'm going to read it to you out of the word of the Lord. Revelation 13, 14 and onwards. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. That's the Antichrist. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast which was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image to be killed. This is serious business. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And then it says, And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. 
in the last days, uh, the Bible tells us there will be a tremendous movement uh, of conformity. People will be told uh, to conform. And the vast majority of people in this world, I tell you, even religious people like you and me will put up their hands and they'll say, me too. Hey, give it to me. I want the mark of the beast too. Because I've never thought a new thought in my life and I, I'm simply marching in line with the crowd. So whatever the priest tells me, whatever the church says, I say, me too. That is mark of the beast thinking. Therefore, my appeal to you is simply this. Think for yourself and get outside the box. Come over here to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 9, 10, and 11. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, 10, and 11. The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them, what does it say? Strong delusion that they should believe the lie. The Bible says in the last days, people, and this is talking especially of religious people, are going to believe the lie. And they're going to put up their hands when it's mark of the beast time and they're going to say, me too. Give me some of that also. I'm so glad that my ancestor, Robert Carter, was not a party man or a company man. I once wondered, uh, since I've lived in this country for more than 30 years, how could this possibly happen? in the land of free people, in the land of brave people, where we glory in our freedom. Proud to be an American, because at least I know I'm free. But you're not free if you're a party man. I don't wonder anymore. I've gone back and I've looked at the footage from just before the Second World War, when the most educated people on the face of the earth, the Germans, the Roman Catholics and Lutherans. About 95% of them said, Sieg, hail, and burned the Jews. Impossible, you say. No, me too. Smart, educated Germans. Now, this is not to offend anybody, but if anybody is offended, I ask you just to please think it through and try to keep an open and a rational mind. This is one reason why I refuse to belong to a political party and conform to the policies of any party. People have said to me, oh, no, you ought to be in that party. No, no, no. Listen, I am not a Democrat and I am not a Republican. I am an independent and I want to belong to Christ's party. And if that offends people, I say, so be it. But is it not time for you to think outside of the box? I want to be like Robert Carter, the descendant of John Carter, who went against the current and the crowd. That's why he was a great American. Now, there's another reason why I am impressed with Robert Carter, the descendant of John Carter from England. Not only did he go against prevailing custom, he did a Christ-like act. He released the slaves when the rest of the Christians were keeping the slaves and lashing them. Can you believe it? They said, the Bible gives us the liberty to lash our slaves. How can Christian people so pervert the word of God? But they did. 
by the millions. You know why? Because they were afraid to think outside the box. Robert Carter thought outside the box. He released the slaves and that's what Jesus did. Jesus cried out from the cross, let freedom ring. That's the gospel. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. And this is a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah 61 and verse 1. Listen to it. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, the Messiah, to preach good tidings to the poor. That means the gospel, good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. So it was the work of the Messiah to let the prisoners go free. And this is talking, of course, not just about the prisoners who were slaving on American farms and other places in the British Empire, but it's talking about the prisoners of sin. Now, if you come over here, please, to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11 and 12, this is a difficult book to read, and that is why lazy people avoid it. Galatians 1, and I don't think that's funny at all. Galatians 1, 11 and 12. The Bible teaches that laziness is a sin. And I can't see how lazy people can be saved. Galatians 1, 11 and 12. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through what? The, what does it say? The revelation of Jesus Christ, the true gospel. This is very difficult to understand. The true gospel is not only taught, as I'm trying to do here today, quite ineffectively, I'm sure. But the Bible says the true gospel is revealed by God so that you'll be, you'll be reading the scriptures or else you'll be listening to a God-anointed preacher and uh, the light will go on. We're not talking here about religion because the world is full of junk religion and it's full of frauds and superstitions. We're talking here about the holy gospel of God. And this is revealed uh, through scripture. As a man in Texas said to me, after I gave a series on the book of Romans, he said, I have been a church girl for 40 years and tonight I see it. What about you? You want to know why so many churches are so dead that they should have been buried years ago? It's because they've never had a revelation of the gospel of God. It comes from God. Galatians 1, 6 to 8, look at this. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ. What does it say? Come on, come on. To a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema, let him be cursed. What a thing to say. So the Apostle Paul, the prince of the apostles, talks about the one true gospel but many perversions. Fake news. So I need to ask myself, and it takes a little bit of spiritual grace to ask myself the question, do I have the true gospel? Now I'm not saying do I belong to the true church. I'm not saying... Uh, Am I a good person? Am I a good father? Am I a good... No, no, I'm asking you the question. We should ask ourselves the question, and this is very difficult. Do I have the true gospel? Or am I believing fake news? Because there's only one true holy gospel. We need to think differently to the brainwashed multitude. Brainwashed multitudes? Yes, sure. 
Try turning on television. Brainwashed multitudes. People are being brainwashed with all sorts of foolish and foolish and stupid ideas. We need to think differently. We need to learn to think God's thoughts that are not man's thoughts and we need to think outside the box. And that's difficult. That's hard. That's not for lazy people. It's for the people who will be saved. Most sermons are about advice. You go to church and the preacher tells you what you need to do. Do, 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 cock-a-doodle-do. Keep doing it. Do it, brother. You got to do it. You got to live this way. You got to eat this. You got to eat. You got to live. That's not the gospel. The gospel is not about do, 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 do. The gospel is about what God has done. The gospel is not good advice. The gospel is good news. That's what the word means. News is about what someone has already done. The gospel is not primarily about you or me. It's about God. It's what God has done. The gospel is the good news that God has freed the prisoners, but most of them don't know and they're still living like slaves. The gospel is about the saviour. Say that word, saviour. It's about the saviour. I need more than an example. Some people, like my friends, the Jesuits, tell me the gospel is the good news that Christ is my example. I want more than an example. If I'm in a river and I'm drowning, I don't want a man on the bank trying to teach me how to swim. I need a strong man who throws me a line. No, I need a strong man who gets in the river and gets me out. I need a, not a swimming lesson. I need a lifeguard. That's the gospel. But many, many, many sermons are lessons on how to swim. I don't need a teacher to tell me how to swim. I need a saviour. Now, we're going to talk about great truths about the true gospel. Uh, the next program that follows this two-part series is going to be on the difference between the gospel of Christ and the gospel as taught by our friends, the Jesuits. Because most folks I know think the Jesuits are right. Oops. So you've got to think outside the box. Here's the first great truth of the gospel. Man was made in God's image. Look at Genesis 1, 27. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I was not made in the image of a monkey. I was made in the image of Almighty God. Now listen to this. I was made a sinless human being. I had no, as the theologians use the word, I had no propensities to sin, no tendencies to evil, no inclination. It was natural for me to obey God. I was made in the image of God. In Eden, now this is going to shock some of you because you're not thinking outside the box. Adam and Eve were saved by obedience. Do this and you will live. And while they um, did these things, they lived. 
God gave to us freedom of choice. They had the capacity to choose good and evil like the angels. That was a great, a marvellous and a dangerous gift. We were not made to be robots. More amazing truths coming very, very soon. Stay with us as we talk about the true gospel and the prevalent fake news. There's only one thing that really counts in this lifetime, your relationship to Christ. And then if you have a right relationship with Christ, you want to tell people about Christ. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. By the grace of God, we're going to do that. We are doing that. That is why we're going back to Cuba, to this communist land, to preach Christ. We're accepting an invitation to go to the, the vast, huge city of Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Been there before, but by the grace of God, we're going back. Please support us. and Please stand with us in the preaching of the everlasting gospel. You say, how do you do it? Who, who pays the bills? We do. Do you get any help, financial help? from the church. No, my friend, we don't. But we get a lot of help from God and from his children. Please support us in the preaching of the everlasting gospel. It's the most important work in all the world. Everything else is almost trivia. So would you please write to me? John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Do your best for Jesus. Do your best for the gospel. And in Australia, write to me at Terrigal. And we promise you this, every dime, every dollar is going to be used to win souls to our Lord Jesus Christ. Please write to me today. Thank you and God bless you. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.